How many trailer tires does it take to get to Arizona? Trick question. This is Eric Stark with the Smart RVer podcast, delivering the smarts you need to enjoy the freedom of the RV lifestyle without the fear of breaking down. Good morning, Alexis. How are you today? I'm good. How are you, Eric? I'm doing wonderful. Awesome. <laughs> so have you ever thought and wondered how many tires does it take to get to Arizona? I have, yes. Lost sleep over it? I have. <laughs> I doubt it. I think you're lying. <laughs> So something that's been coming up in our store recently, before we get into the living the RV life, is people that have bought RVs with residential refrigerators. And what we're finding is, no one wants to work on them. Because <laughs> it's not an RV refrigerator, it's put in an RV space in the RV. You pretty much have to take the refrigerator out to work on it most of the times. It might even have an access door in the back like RV refrigerators do, but they really don't help. So we're finding people having a tough time getting someone to work on it. The appliance shops are kind of pushing back, especially if it's warranty. So just keep that in mind if you have an RV refrigerator. You might want to start looking around for someone to work on it. And maybe there's a dealership that sells RVs near you or a service center that will work on it or they have someone they can bring in, but look into that before you have a problem. Because what we're finding is, the customers here anyways are kind of getting stuck. Because yeah. they don't have a place to go. So it's kind of a drag, you know? It's a good idea, but there's the things that come out afterwards that, you know, kind of bite us. Yeah. And I think everybody's looking at our, or the residential refrigerator, like their household refrigerator, how it could sit in that corner in the kitchen for 20 years and never anything goes wrong with it. Well, RV is different. They're bouncing down the road, plugged in, <laughs> unplugged, you know, not so good. Uh-huh. All right. So then next Friday, November 4th, is going to be the first free tip Friday. One tip in 10 minutes episode. So that's going to be on the, on the regular podcast channels and on YouTube. So that's free tip Friday, one tip in 10 minutes. Exciting. Trying to get used to saying that. It's kind of a tongue twister. Why do we pick names like that, Alexis? I don't know. <laughs> we spent hours on this, right? We did. Days, we really weeks, did. months. Don't let them know that. And we come up with that. <laughs> Free tip Friday. Sounds good. All right. So that's starting November 4th. So now let's talk about living the RV life. Keeping your RV organized. Now, if you ever come to the store and you see where Alexis sits, you can see the meaning behind this organization because her place is always organized, nice and tidy, <laughs> clean, everything's in its place. Aww. And that's good. <laughs> so now our RV, do we keep our RV organized? And there's a reason why you want to keep your RV organized. You know, when you're trying to find something, you're in a hurry, something breaks, you're looking for a tool, you're looking for a whatever, a piece of clothing, your left shoe right sock, <laughs> you know, it can get really aggravating. And when you're in an RV, it's a smaller space. And if your family's with you, you know, sometimes tempers get short, especially with family members. Somehow we can just scream and yell at a family member like we would never scream and yell at anybody else, right? <laughs> so keeping it or organized certainly has its values or benefits. So you want to create a storage plan. And so we're not talking about, you know, big old giant wall, like maybe behind me with yarn and pictures and strings, like a matrix. It's just a plan. A simple plan is fine. And just decide what you need to store and where you want to store it, you know, and how accessible it needs to be. Because, you know, some one of the ways to store stuff is by getting the uh, Tupperware bins. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you can stack them. And so things that are not used that often maybe go at the bottom. Or if you can go too deep, you know which I think you know what I mean. So it's just deciding what you need and how often you need it. Um, just get rid of stuff. In an RV, you know, you don't need anything you don't need. <laughs> just get rid of it. We can call it clutter. So the things that you don't ever use in your RV, you know, if you feel you have to have them, maybe store them in the back of the cabinet, someplace where they're out of the way, they're not in the way. Because, you know, when you're looking for something, the more things you have to go through, the harder it is. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, it's like processing data. You know, when you're reading something, you're looking for two words and you got to read 700 words to find the two words. You're processing all this data for no reason. So you're moving stuff for no reason. 
So make use of the vertical spaces in the RV, um, you know, install shelves, hooks, and other things to organize or maximize the storage space. As I said earlier, use the bins, you know, Tupperware makes great stuff, and there's so much stuff beyond Tupperware anymore, um, but Tupperware is the king of that category. But, you know, plastic bins work great, and label them, you know, if there's a lot of stuff in there, you can't see through it, label it so you know what's in there. And I used to kind of scoff at that kind of organization. Now, I'm pretty organized. But that always seemed kind of ridiculous to me. But now I kind of see the benefit. Karen, my wife's mother, she was that way. Oh. Everything was labeled and stored. And I kind of see the wisdom in it now. Because she'd find stuff right away. Yeah. Oh, there's 400 boxes in the cabinet. She'd walk in and, dink, you know, <laughs> pull the right one out. So keep the floor of the RV clear, put everything away when you're not using it. Basically just keep it organized, you know, and don't just throw everything out the door. Keep the outside organized too, you know, the, so you can get to whatever, whenever. It just makes it easier. And heck, that's part of being a good neighbor too up here in a campground. So follow these steps. It's going to make your life easier. It's going to be better. You know, I did talk about this in a previous episode about compartmentalizing your RV. I think it went a little more in depth. I forget which episode that was, but probably uh, 105, 106, somewhere in there. Um, sorry for not knowing that, but if you go to the website, thesmartrvier.com, or even iTunes, it'll be there. Um, it's about compartmentalizing your RV. So now I'm going to ask you to spend some time this month just looking at your RV, getting it organized. Spend a little bit of time. You don't have to spend a lot of time, but just do it. I think everybody will appreciate it. And when you get on, go on a trip, just remind the family, let's keep everything put away this time. Let's not leave everything laying out if that's been the normal deal. Kids can especially be really bad at that where you want to take all their stuff and just throw it away. <laughs> Seeing my dad do it when we were younger. <laughs> I know how to do it now. All right, so now let's get to staying on the road. And we're going to talk about trailer tires. So Alexis, how many trailer tires do you think it takes to get to Arizona? Well, it's not a unicycle, so probably four. <laughs> it's not a unicycle. Good observation. So it, it should only take four. So your guess is right. If you have four tires on your RV or, your, excuse me, your trailer, it should take four. Mm -hmm. If you have two tires, it should take two. So a tandem versus single axle. So why do I ask the question, how many tires does it take? Well, if your tires aren't in good shape, it might take five, might take six, seven, eight of them to get there because they're going to keep blowing out. One blows out, the other one's going to blow out. It's almost guaranteed. And I bring up this subject, you know, I've talked about it before, but I'm bringing it up again because so many people right now are getting ready or are heading to Arizona, Florida, Texas, and California. Mm -hmm. So they're going where the warmer, or the weather is warmer for the winter time. And some people leave early. They have reasons why they're going to go visit family. They take their time getting there. They're going to travel around, um, see a couple things along the way. You know, they kind of make it a, a big trip and get to Arizona or Florida, Texas, and they chill out for, you know, three, four, five, six months. So when you're heading south or traveling in general, but in this case, heading south, you're going to these one of these hot spots. Really, you want to make sure your tires are going to make it. You know, there's, there's nothing worse than having a flat tire out in the middle of nowhere or anywhere for that matter. Flat tires just suck. It's a problem. <laughs> you know, you're, you expose yourself to danger being on the side of the road. You know, people don't really care anymore. They'll drive by you. If you're, if your trailer's on a jack, you know, there's a chance of knocking it off the jack, someone getting hit. You know, even truck drivers don't even go around that often anymore. They seem to just blow by this stuff and they don't really care. I'm not saying everybody, but it's happening. So we have to be cautious. You'd hate to get killed or have a family member get killed out on the road. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you want to check your tires at home in your driveway before you ever leave on a trip. And now if you're doing a lot of traveling, that means you're going to have to check them from here and there and along the way, keep an eye on, them. you know, trailer tires, especially trailer tires <laughs> will go bad quite more often than a uh, motorhome tire. It's just the way they're designed, the way they're made. So while you're at home, check your tires and it's more than just checking the air pressure. It's looking at the sidewalls. It's looking at the tread. It's checking the valve stems. 
you know, just the air pressure, that's one thing. That's a major portion of it. You want to make sure that air pressure is at the maximum PSI. So if your tires require maximum 80 PSI, that's what you put them at. You always want it the max because your trailer is always loaded. Um, even with it, when you're not packed and loaded for a trip, the weight of it still requires the maximum tire pressure. So you always want to do that. But when you look at your tires, look at it from three different angles, the sidewalls, the tire tread, and the valve stems. You want to make sure that everything's in good shape. And don't try to just stand back and glance and try to get it all in one shot. Inspect each thing individually. Inspect the sidewalls. You know, look at your sidewalls. Make sure they're not cracked or checking, as it's called. And there's no problems there, no big gouges in the sidewall. You know, you might hit something and not even realize it. And you got a gouge there. Because sometimes, you know, with RVs, you can hit something, especially a trailer, and you don't even realize it. You know, you don't feel it. So you, things like that can happen. So check your sidewalls. Now, obviously, the inside of the tires are going to be much harder to get at. You know, so if the outside sidewall is in pretty good shape, more than likely the inside sidewall will be because it's not even exposed to the sun or light in the shade all the time and it's really not going to hit anything unless you're like in a very odd situation or out on a dirt road and a rock were to get it <clears throat> so more than likely you don't have to check the inside of the side of the tire <clears throat> just the exterior and then check the tread and so this is where a lot of the stuff happens that will cause the blowout down the road all the signs are generally there the tread might look great, like, you know, maybe the tires only have a thousand miles on them. Oh, I got another 30,000 miles on these tires easy because the tread looks so good. The tread is not an indicator in most cases. Now, if you use your RV or you're pulling it all the time, you know, you put in 5,000 miles on it a month or 10,000 miles, yeah, then the tread wearing down will be an indicator. But you'd still have to check everything else on the top of that tire, you know, in between the, the tread. So regardless of the tread, you want to look for cracks. You want to look for splits, even the, uh, you know, the, the tread separating. Stand back and from a distance, look at the tire and see if the tread has got a, a, big, you know, a, a big round spot. It's like ballooning out. Mm -hmm. Maybe not real big, but it makes the tire look out around. You know, the bigger it is, the worse it is. So even if it's small, that means the tread is separating. And you have to be careful too because sometimes the tires can kind of play tricks on your eyes and it might look like it's got a problem and it doesn't really. So look at all of them and kind of compare, you know, open and close your eyes, rub them, do whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you want to do that. It's very important. I, I kind of push this because I see how many RVs come into our store for service work and the tires are bad. And quite often the, the comment is, well, they'll get me through the rest of summer, you know, and you see the, the tread is separating. And you, no, it won't, you know. <laughs> but sometimes it's just a budgetary issue and they don't want to spend the money because they only have one more trip or whatever it might be. And locally, you know, they go 50 miles, it might work out. But on a long distance trip, you're going to Arizona, you want to make sure the tires are in good shape. And the other thing to keep in mind too is, you know, you're checking this stuff. And you check the valve stems and they're good. You know, you bend them over, they don't crack. You know, everything looks great. Well, even the highways this time of year, you're going to those places where it's warmer than where you're leaving. So the roads there can be much hotter. In Arizona this time, or yeah, this time of year, you know, the highway might, you know, might be 90 to 100 degrees outside, but the road's going to be much hotter than that. It might be 120, 130, 140 degrees in the shade. I mean, excuse me, in the direct sun. So the tires are going to run hotter. Greater chance of them blowing out if there's a problem. You know, the cooler tires are, the better they are. You know, if you can drive in the rain. I remember coming one time from Arizona to Montana, we got rainy and tire weight. And I thought, how nice. Because it keeps the tires cooler, keeps the wheel bearings cooler. It's just like you don't have to think about it, you know. And I guess my mind is always on tires because I've, over the years, seeing so many people with tire problems mm -hmm. stuck on the side of the road or coming to the store asking for help, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the temperatures where you're going can have an effect. You know, if you leave Montana now, it's probably 70 degrees out today. 
but the farther south you go, the warmer it gets. Remember also when you're driving too, the tires are just building up heat. They're only going to get so hot, but it all adds up, you know. So I'm not trying to scare anybody from traveling anywhere. We just have to be realistic about what we're doing and where we're going when it comes to our trailer tires. And if you take the principles from this, it will apply to motorhome tires as well. Motorhome tires are more like automotive tires. They're built differently. So they, they handle differently. They, they perform differently. They're not going to have the same blowout ratio as a trailer tire. It's just the design. The same with your tow vehicle. You know, you're towing your trailer with the pickup truck. Those tires are not going to wear out and fail like, they, like the possibility of a trailer because the way trailer tires are designed, they have a a heavy sidewall and the the tread is basically a weaker point it's a weaker link they don't get used all the time and trailer tires lubricate internally so you can't see what's happening on the inside and that's one of the big dangers you know you can look on the outside but depending on what's happening on the inside that can be your problem and you know speaking of that if you're heading south and your trailer's been sitting for six months or eight months or a year in the same spot you know, the tread inside or the cord inside is probably already breaking and you just can't see it. Mm. Did you know that, Alexis? I did not know that. That's kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on a car, you'll drive it and it'll get flat spots. You know, if it sits for a long time, it'll sure. dunk, 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 and gradually they work out and they seem to be okay. <laughs> but on a trailer, that doesn't happen. Oh. The tread is the cord inside can be broken and you just don't know it. Yeah. So to help alleviate that, you know, if you can take your trailer out once a month and put 10 miles on it, I know it's a hassle or every couple months, put 20 miles on it, do something to keep those tires moving and it keeps them lubricated. So, you know, we don't want to forget about the person that's let their RV sit for six or eight months. And now you're going back to Arizona. You got a 2,500 mile trip you want to get there mm -hmm. and you know maybe you've never had a blowout on the road maybe you've never had a flat you know your trailers made it to and from you know and you might just think well i don't have to do anything and maybe that works you know sometimes when we don't know any better it seems <laughs> to work <laughs> you know i've seen out four wheel and you see people how they get there in that car and well it's because they didn't know any better you know <laughs> when you yeah. see these big monster trucks struggling <laughs> But, you know, I, I always carry two spares, no matter what trailer I'm towing. If it's a utility trailer, dump trailer, my travel trailer, two spares. So if you get one blowout, more than likely another tire is going to blow right after it. Mm -hmm. And that way you're covered. And like I said, there's nothing worse than being stuck on the side of the road. In this day and age, too, with all the crazy people out there that just hate anybody for anything, you know, <laughs> you might become that target. You don't want to be there. Yeah. All right, so hopefully I covered that without scaring you, but just be prepared when you go on a trip like that to check the trailer tires. And <clears throat> while you're there, you might as well check your suspension too. Make sure the leaf springs are in good shape, that the hangers are in good shape. There's no oblong holes where the, the leaf springs bolt up to the hangers or the shackle links, the ones that move back and forth on the rear of the axle or the rear of the leaf spring. Just give it all a once over, you know. You're riding on that. That's important. And then, you know, if you're, depending on where you're at and how long you're there, you have to go through this whole process all over again very thoroughly when you head back home. Because maybe you made it there, but maybe that puts your tires at the very maximum of what they can take. And going back home, it's going to be, you know, going the opposite direction, but it's still the same distance. So check them out when you leave again. So if you're parked in Florida for six months, Check your tires out real good before you head back to New York or wherever you're going to. Mm. You know, you're, it's a two-way street there, literally. <laughs> so another thing to keep in mind, too, is um, a customer brought this to my attention. I don't know if it's from the podcast or the store. I don't remember. And I didn't really think about this. So if you have aluminum wheels on your RV, quite often your lug nuts will not work on your spare because your spare is going to be a steel spare. And the steel spare is not as thick as an aluminum spare. So the lug nut might bottom out before it ever tightens down the wheel. So you want to make sure you have at least five spare lug nuts 
that have, you know, all the way through, they're like what's on the wheel of a car when there's a hubcap or a wheel cover on it, just a basic lug nut, not chrome or anything, so it'll tighten down that spare wheel. Mm -hmm. So that could be, you know, pretty, pretty disappointing out on the road. You put your spare on, it's all aired mm -hmm. up, and you're ready to go, and you can't get the lug nuts tight, or you don't even realize that the, how, that the wheel's not that tight. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure you have the right lug nuts for your spare. If you have two spares, you need 10 or 12 or 16, depending on how many, what your lug pattern is. But make sure you have the lug nuts and have them someplace you can find them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't stash them away so good you can never find them. It goes back to being organized, right? So put them with your tools or someplace that you would find them. Like in my trailer, I have a jack just for that purpose. So I would leave them right next to the jack, probably in a bag or something. So they're right there, easy to get to. Cause I have all that stuff very accessible. Cause when you get a flat, it, to me, it's like you're on a race car track, you know, a pit crew, you got to get in and get out, get it done, you know, do as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. All right. So now that I've talked about that for a little bit, um, one more <laughs> thing, you might have tr uh, tire pressure, monitoring system or a tr or a tire pressure monitoring system on your RV. And that's great. That tells you the tire pressure and tells you when it's, you know, you're losing it, but it doesn't tell you the shape of your tires. So you still have to look at your tires and make sure they're in good shape. And speaking of tire pressure monitoring systems, right now I am reviewing Lippert Components Tire Link System and TST's tire link or their tire pressure monitoring system. So in the next couple of weeks, next episode or two, I'm going to have the results. I'm going pretty thorough on this. So it takes a little bit of time, two to three weeks for each system to see how it works. And so if you have a favorite system, let me know and let me see what I can find on it. And maybe they'll send me a set and I can do a real hands-on test with them. So I'm going to have the results probably in November um, or later in November, possibly December. It depends, but stay tuned for that. And I'll definitely talk about it. It will be part of an episode. Um, and like I said, for more trailer tire safety information, you go to episode 88. So episode 88 at the smartrvr.com and you'll definitely have more information there about trailer tire safety. All right, so now we are finally getting to the next stop. Alexis is sitting here so patiently listening <laughs> to me babble on about tires. <laughs> now, today we're going to talk about Finger Lakes, New York. Yeah. Here's what I know about Finger Lakes, New York. Ray Romano was on an episode of The Office, and he was applying for a job. And I think it was him. He was in a big hurry because he wanted to get back to his family at the Finger Lakes. <laughs> he was another person, but it was on that episode. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> I got to get to the Finger Lakes. You think I can get to the Finger Lakes? That's what I know about the Finger Lakes. <laughs> and until that point, I never even heard of the Finger Lakes. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and then after that, I wonder if it was real. So now we know. <laughs> it is. All right, Alexis. So what is going on at the Finger Lakes that that you want to want us to travel there for? Well, Eric, this place is kind of for the wine lover. So I don't know if you like wine. I'm sort of a fan, <laughs> um, but it's famous for its wine and its vineyards. So that might be something to check out. <laughs> okay, so it's a little bias here then. <laughs> Okay, so is this like for the wine connoisseur then? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's over 130 vineyards there. So, wow. yeah, it's kind of a popular spot for for enthusiasts. <laughs> so that's kind of like uh, Sonoma Valley in California exactly. type of thing. Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. So it's the wine central of New York. Now, <laughs> um, okay, so there's the wineries, and you have a couple of men here, three brothers, wineries in the States, so they're tasting, mm -hmm. cafe. Yep. So yeah. I'm sure all the wineries have tasting rooms. I'm sure. Pretty yeah, much. And you can go to. there and buy wine as well. So yeah. you can do the whole thing. Yeah. So that's cool. If you like wine, it would definitely be interesting. Even if you're not a wine con connoisseur, you know, not really into it. It's just sometimes interesting to see the processes. Exactly. Of how things yeah. are made and kind of what they go through to store the wine while it's uh, ripening and right. doing what it's doing, fermenting. Right. You know, a little bit different than a beer factory where it, you know, goes in five minutes later, it comes out a can, and, you know, <laughs> you drink it. Wine takes a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, 
Hopefully it does. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay, so you recommend going there for the wine yeah. person. Yeah. All right. Now, what else is there to do besides the wineries? Well, this is from another episode of The Office, but <laughs> uh, there's Niagara Falls, which is pretty neat. You can take a boat tour or you can helicopter over it. There's a lot to see in Niagara Falls if you've never been there. Or you can get married there on a boat. That's right. You can. <laughs> get all wet under the falls. Yep, yep. <laughs> So I've never been to the Niagara Falls. It looks interesting. Um, the boat tour would probably be really cool, getting close to the falls like that. A helicopter would take a totally new spin on that. It would, wouldn't it? Yeah. You know, today with drone technology, we see all this stuff in these aerial views, which is pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah. So that would be kind of fun. And then you see the surrounding area, put it all into context. Exactly. Okay, so you can go kayaking and paddleboarding there too? Yeah, there's a ton. I mean, obviously the Finger Lakes, there's a ton of lakes. So, um, one place that rents them out is Regan's Canoe and Kayak Livery. So check them out. <laughs> All right. Very good. So then for the real adventure, you can kayak or canoe over the falls. There you go. Yeah. I don't know about that. What a way to end the trip, right? <laughs> end your life. Tell your family, I'll be back in a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now, of course, there's always places to eat. Everywhere we go, there's some place to eat. Mm -hmm. So now there's a place called Thai Elephants. Yeah. So do they serve elephants there or? Well, sometimes if you request it. No, <laughs> mostly it's Thai food. It's uh, their fried rice I heard is really good. Okay. So that's something you can get there. <laughs> All right, so Thai Elephants for Thai food. And yeah. of course there's a barbecue place. Of course, I always have to mention of it. Course. But Beef and Brew, very nice little barbecue spot. And then there's Ports Cafe and they serve seafood. Okay, so it sounds like it has food for everybody. That's right. <laughs> different flavors, different personalities, whatever you like, there's always food there. Yeah. Okay, then of course there's places to stay, right? Yeah, absolutely. A ton of them. Um, for one, there's Indian Village RV Park. I think that has around 100 spots or so. Um, there's Consensus Lake RV Park. Again, they advertise for free Wi-Fi, so if that's And what do we you, say when there's free Wi-Fi? That you can go to the smartrvier.com. Very good. All right. <laughs> yeah. And then there's, I hope I'm saying this right, Sned Acres Family Campground. <laughs> and they have a lot of amenities there. So if that is, that's something important to you, then you might want to check out their website. All right. Very good. So when you're at these campgrounds, or actually when you're at any of these places, just remember talking around, talking to everybody, tell them that the Smart RVer told you about it. That's right. And tell them they need to go to the website. Yeah. You know, share. <laughs> you know, get people, more people to listen to the show. Yeah. All right. So, of course, there's some place to stay because everywhere we go on the next stop, there's always a place for our viewers. There's always a campground. Yes. One way or another, there's going to be a campground. I think we talked about in Florida where there are super nice ones and pretty low end ones. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so, but there is a place to stay. So, it's up to you. And so when's the best time to go to the Finger Lakes in New York? Well, actually, and I this surprised me, but May to September seemed to be to be the good uh, time to go. Not as many tourists were reported. So I don't know. It seems like the hot spot to me, but I guess that's when it's good to go. <laughs> wow, that's a yeah, that's a big window of time too. I know. <laughs> but it's probably just weather. Yeah. And you know, especially if you're in the East Coast where they get a lot more snow than we do, that colder weather. Yep. You know, as soon as it warms up, man, everybody busts out and goes. That's and then right. they're going to stay out until the end of September. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I've been in New York in November, and it's definitely not camping season. No, it is not. You know, I've been <laughs> upstate. I've been all over New York in the winter months, and it's just not the place to be. That's right. Or to be outside anyway. Yeah, definitely not. So I can see that. It's just, it is a large window, and it does seem like it'd be a pretty crowded place at that time. Yeah, Niagara yeah. Falls probably would be, but other portions of it are probably good. Probably you know? so, yeah. Yeah, but it's still worthwhile checking out, especially if you're from like the western states. Going back east, it's worth it. If you've never been back east, you got to go back east. Mm -hmm. Mark it on your calendars. Even if you drove there, stayed for 10 minutes and looked around and left, you know, it's worth the drive to see a yeah. lot of the east coast, even the midwest, you know. Oh, yeah. I shouldn't say and even, that sounds bad after someone just compared New York to Kansas a while back and made kind of 
sound bad, but the mid or the Midwest is a cool place too. <laughs> so it's the entire experience mm -hmm. driving across the U.S. There's so much to see, and then you can take what you see on TV and actually make it real, you yeah. know, and put it into a perspective that you can relate to. Yes. All right, perfect. So now. Finger Lakes, New York, we're going to leave from there. We're going to go back down south again to talk about RV Envy for a moment. Now, this is true RV Envy. When you're in the southern states where the sun is shining, or maybe if you're in Florida and the rain is raining and you want some protection, Sun Pro Manufacturing, which you know is a company we own and we make sunshade products for RVs. We make awning drops, we make in panels, we make windshield covers, side window covers. And when you're in those areas, you really need to block out the sun. You know, I say Florida for rain, because I remember one year a guy called us, we made all this custom stuff for him. So when it was raining, he didn't have to bring every, his awning drop in, his awning. He had all this stuff made, it was pretty interesting. A little over the top maybe, but it was interesting. But like in Arizona, everybody has sunshade. Their awnings are out the entire winter time. They're outside, they enjoy the outdoors. Everybody's tanned, you know, they just <laughs> love being outside. But they do like to have the privacy or they're kicking back underneath their awning to not be exposed to the sun. So Sun Pro Manufacturing is the website to check out, sunpromfg.com, or you can call us at eight or no 406-961-8688. And we can make an awning drop, an in panel, window covers, windshield covers. We do all of that. And you definitely like our material. It's 90%, blocks out a lot of the sun. Great quality product. Okay, so this is more like a sales pitch, isn't it? But RV Envy starts somewhere, and you got to have the nice, cool place to hang out with some privacy as well. So you can go to the smartrver.com, and there'll be a link there under this episode. Or you can go directly to SunPro Manufacturing or SunProMFG.com and look at the sunshades. You won't regret that. So now we are coming to the end of the show, and I want to remind everybody to check out Free Tip Friday, One Tip in 10 Minutes. It's going to be in between these episodes, so it's bi-weekly. So when this episode comes out, the following week, there'll be Free Tip Friday on the Friday, and then, you know, it's going to be a rotation. So check that out. It's going to be one tip in one minute about RV products or about uh, things pertaining to the RV lifestyle. So it's a great little 10 minute deal we're doing there. All right, so I wanna thank everybody for listening today and for Alexis joining us here at the podcast. So this is Eric Stark with the Smart RVer Podcast. It's been great hanging out with everyone. If I don't see you on the road, let's connect at thesmartrver.com.